Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that was okay. Um, yeah, we want to welcome you all to this our session, um, HMTSS and Social Emotional Learning in a Virtual Setting. Uh, it's uh, module number two, for those of you who are wondering. Uh, and what we want to do this morning, uh, this morning, this afternoon, is to just introduce you to the Hawaii Multi-Tiered System of Support and uh, talk to you a little bit about social emotional learning, especially in a virtual setting. So we have a couple of learning uh, goals for today. And Karen, if you want to forward it. Uh, the first one is, again, to increase your understanding of HMTSS, uh, the Hawaii Multi-Tiered System of Support. And the second is to learn a little bit about the social and emotional learning domain. And we realize that most of you are teachers so we're going to try and make it relevant to the classroom as well. And the second objective or goal is just so that um, we get some idea of maybe things that to consider um, because a lot of the teaching going on now is in a distance learning set. So with that, we'll get started. And uh, I'm doing the first section on the Hawaii Multitude System of Support. So with that, uh, the first thing is what is it? Yeah. And so HMTSS is kind of uh, our take, the Hawaii Department, State Department of Education's take on uh, kind of a national trend, which is using multi-tiered systems of support in school, in a school setting and in classrooms as well to ensure that all of our students um, are, have access and the ability to um, participate in practices that use resources in an efficient way so that all students within a school are supported. And so you can take a look at the bullet points. I'm not really gonna go through all of them uh, one by one, but uh, there are some real um, benefits of having HMTSS. And that is that it's flexible for schools to customize. It incorporates things that you're already doing. And um, it really is a sound approach that we found to uh, to take a look at what students need and how they learn. Uh, okay, so MTSS, if you want to forward it uh, to the next slide. Um, according to uh, according to the Every Student Succeeds Act, um, it's a it's it's quoted there as a comprehensive continuum of evidence based systemic practices to support a rapid response to student needs with regular observation to facilitate database instructional decision making. So those are a lot of words, but basically it's just saying that there's, uh, we use evidence-based practices in an organized way and we base it, our decision making on data and um, looking at students regularly. And so there is no, um, national consensus as to one definition of MTSS. And a lot of states have uh, developed their own definitions for their own state. So HMTSS, the Hawaii Multi-Tier System of Support, is our definition for what we see uh, MTSS is for public schools in Hawaii. Okay, next slide. Um, so why do we want to use uh, HMTSS? Uh, we have had for years and years a comprehensive student support system. And HMTSS is not very much different from it, actually in concept, in that it is looking at the whole child, it is looking at providing equity. But what we found is that there have been so many iterations of CSSS, the Comprehensive Student Support System, that it was, uh, we felt it was beneficial to just kind of do a refresh on it and change the terminology to HMTSS so that we can all be using the same language and understanding it in the same way. So there are a number of reasons why we use HMTSS. Um, it really is a proactive system that tries to address student needs before they begin to fail or as they're beginning to fail, I guess, is another way to put it. But um, that we really want to look at uh, student support uh, at the front end and not at the back end. It is a systematic, systematic approach, and it's a way to make sure that the myriad of needs that students have uh, that are limited, very limited resources is gonna be, uh, 
are used in the best way to meet uh, as many of those needs as possible. Okay. Um, so introducing HMTSS, and this may be new for some of you. For some of you, you may have seen this before. We have four functions that we're really trying to uh, fulfill through HMTSS, and those are on the right-hand side of the graphic. And on the left-hand side are the four components, the four core components of HMTSS. So first of all, we need to establish what we believe. And so we have a conversation at the school level about foundational beliefs. Then we wanna make sure that we, we're making choices about uh, student, we're making decisions about students based on uh, a valid process and looking at the right information. And so that's data-driven team-based decision-making. Then we wanna make sure that for our particular students, whether it's in a school or in a classroom, that we know our students because there's, that's the first step in meeting the needs of our students is to know our students. And we do that through universal screening and pro uh, progress monitoring, which is the third component. And the fourth component that we organize our resources, whatever programs, whatever um, interventions we have in the school. And those are organized in a, a logical way. And that's the multi-tiered system of evidence-based practices. So I'm gonna talk really briefly about all, uh, about the four components. And so if we go to the first component, um, that's foundational beliefs. So uh, in every school, there are certain beliefs that the staff has, the faculty, the administration has, which guide the decision-making, guide what you do in the school. So uh, we feel as part of HMTSS, it's important to be able to identify, articulate, and communicate those beliefs to the whole school community so that everybody can be working together to try and achieve uh, the, the purpose we have for HMTSS, which is to meet all student needs. And um, we're looking at it in such a way that uh, those needs are based on things like what you see on the screen, all students can learn. That's a foundational belief. And if we don't believe that, then we'll be limited in the way we can approach students in meeting their needs. And so there are certain uh, beliefs that promote student learning and there are certain beliefs that may be detrimental or, or hindering student learning. And so we wanna be able to identify those, talk about them with our, our, uh, with our staff especially, and to uh, make sure that we're approaching it in the same way and with um, kind of a more uh, education positive type of belief. So uh, for each of these components, if you go to the next slide, uh, we have certain considerations for in a distance learning setting. And a lot of these for HMTSS are the same, whether it's for distance learning or for in-person learning or blended learning, but it's just a matter of adapting those concepts or those processes uh, into the proper technological, uh, environmental, and um, uh, whatever the parameters are of the, the mode in which you're teaching. So uh, in a virtual setting, in a distance learning setting, you wanna prioritize your standards because there's not gonna be enough to, as much time to teach everything you wanna teach. And so um, these are some things to consider using synchronous and asynchronous learning, having a positive learning environment through real time uh, virtual engagement um, and talking about what you wanna, how you wanna work with parents. And there's two sides of that. One is that we need to, we can't expect parents to be there all the time, but we can also expect that parents may be there all the time. So those things are challenges. And for component one foundational beliefs for HMTSS, all of those things should be considered. Okay, uh, component two is uh, decision-making, that it's data-driven and team-based. There are two reasons you would wanna use data to make decisions. One is to improve the, system, which is what is the curriculum, the instruction, the supports that you're pro providing to all students. And also you wanna use uh, data to make decisions about individual students. And this is true at a school level. This is uh, true in a content area or a grade level if we're elementary school, that those two uh, purposes should be met. And there's a process that you go through and that's the graphic on the right. And hopefully 
this slide deck will be made available to you so you can take a look at it because I know I'm, I'm just ripping through this, but um, I'm trying to get to the SEL section so you guys can have some really um, uh, concrete uh, uh, tips for you. So there's certain things in, in a distance setting that you want to consider about decision making. And uh, that would be the next slide. Um, and those are that uh, in, in the same way you establish standards for student, but also that there's a little bit more of an, a need to communicate clearly and frequently to both families and students, because there is such chaos going around now that the more communication, the more transparency, uh, the better it'll end up in the long run. Uh, one thing that we try to uh, impress is that the same types of regular team meetings you're having when you're in a face-to-face uh, -face, uh, physical setting shouldn't stop because you're in a virtual setting. And so we encourage everyone to continue to meet in your PLCs, to continue to meet in your student support teams or whatever team you may have, that the school leadership team should maintain still regular formatted meetings and just to make sure that all of that is uh, taken care of. And finally, that uh, there's an enhanced role for parents that we need to engage them to. The third component and, uh, is making sure that we know our students through universal screening and progress monitoring. Universal screening being that we take a look at every student. Like this could use a formal screener, it doesn't have to. Not, it doesn't have to. We encourage using formal screeners, but it's not just a formal screener, uh, the way you look at students, but just to make sure that you know how your students are doing. And especially in a virtual setting, that's important. And progress monitoring, making sure that our programs are sufficient for our students to progress as uh, needed and that each student is progressing, how we're hoping they're progressing. In a virtual setting for uh, universal screening and progress monitoring, realize that, and again, this is the same as in a physical setting, non-academic non issues um, are as important as academic issues. So we're talking about behavior, we're talking about social and emotional health and wellness, we're talking about physical health and wellness, but they may not be as apparent in distance learning settings. So we need to be more intentional about looking for uh, students who may be in need of greater support. Um, and so you want to screen your students often, not necessarily using a screener, but making sure that you check in with them and make sure they're doing okay in all of the facets of their lives. Um, and then for progress monitoring, again, it's not just a progress monitoring tool, but you use formative assessments, grades, observation. Uh, if you're giving them homework, taking a look at how they're progressing that homework, but it's looking at data that's um, that's at the front end and not at the back end. And, uh, and finally, that you wanna, even though it's in a distance learning setting, you wanna have real-time observation to ensure that students are progressing the way they should. Okay, finally, and I have a couple minutes left, so I need to keep going. Uh, we have the multi-tiered system of supports, and that's the way, that's the actual framework and how uh, your resources are structured. So you can take a look at that um, pyramid there. And as you can see, it's a three-tiered pyramid. On the first level, tier one, it's what you provide for all students. So that's your curriculum and instruction, um, all the uh, social emotional learning you're providing them. If you're using PBIS, it would be the school-wide behavioral expectations, which again will change in the distance. But it's what you provide for every student. Then. There's a secondary level and a tertiary level, tiers two and three, that provide, provide supports for those students who may need a little bit more help than what you provided in tier one. The goal is to try and get tier one to about 80% so that your resources are not um, spread too thin. Because if you have 60% of students at tier two, you're gonna be in a world of hurt in terms of the amount of time and the amount of energy you're putting up to make sure that all students are um, supported. So if you can, so we say that the biggest bang for the buck is at tier one. Um, if we go on, it's a layered system on the next slide. Um, so we provide all students with that tier one supports, but the supplemental and intensive supports at tier two and tier three, they're, in a, they're supplemental, they're in addition to tier one. 
We don't stop doing tier one if we give them additional interventions or supports uh, because that's a recipe for them falling behind for sure. So maintain the um, tier one supports, uh, but for certain students that we identify through universal screening, we may need to add additional interventions and supports. Um, next slide. Then we also wanna want everyone to realize that there aren't tier two students and tier three students. There are students who receive tier two interventions or supports and tier three interventions and supports. So you can see for an individual student, they may be at different levels for different aspects of their learning or their emotional health. Um, and uh, so we want to acknowledge that and make sure that those things are considered. Once you're in a tier, it doesn't mean that you have to stay there. We're working toward getting everybody or as many people as possible back down to tier one. Yeah. And so finally, if we go to the next slide, what does uh, HMTSS look like in a school? This is a slide that we had before. And what does it look like in a classroom? Which is the next slide. Uh, it looks exactly the same. In a classroom, you're talking about uh, at tier one, what do you provide for all the students in the class? And then what are the secondary and tertiary supports and interventions that you're using to support those students who need a little bit more help. Finally, uh, considerations for distance learning. Um, because uh, distance learning and working virtually, there's so many more options. Uh, we wanna encourage people to take advantage of those options and be creative and develop different uh, options for delivering service services because the same way you differentiate for students in person, you can differentiate for students online. And we all hear about the student that learns better online and those that are more lost because of either technological limitations or even their home environment or stuff like that. So we wanna be able to um, develop things in different ways to meet the needs of all students. We want to be more flexible with schedule if possible because students and parents are available at different times and we're not necessary. And because we're teaching a lot less in real time, even in a distance setting, um, we don't necessarily have to start at 7.45 in the morning and end at 2.30 in the afternoon unless you guys are concerned about your contracts. But other than that, uh, realize that there is a lot more that can be done. You can teach in real time. You can also teach in what's called asynchronous settings, which is making things available for students to do on their own time or on their own schedule. And so those things are um, really uh, things to consider when you're in the distance learning environment. Finally, that, um, realize that there are limitations in time. And so we want to make sure that those are covered. So I want, yeah, sorry, Fern. So I'm going to hand it over to Fern now and she's going to talk specifically about S uh, social emotional learning. Thanks. Sorry, Gordon, I wasn't trying to rush you. <laughs> Where's my cursor? <laughs> Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Fern Yoshida. I work out of the Office of Student Support Services, and the area I primarily work with is social emotional learning and trauma. Um, and I'm going to talk with you more about the domain of social emotional learning within the Hawaii multi-tiered system of support. So what Gordon shared with you regarding the four components is kind of like the frame of the house, the strong structure or infrastructure that's in place to ensure that we have a sturdy foundation for the four domains that he mentioned and social emotional learning being one of them. So social emotional learning is a process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible and caring decisions. So that's social emotional learning in a nutshell. So the social emotional learning domain, as I mentioned earlier, um, may be tiered by the three levels of support. 
tier one supports all students through a well integrated implementation system of best practices that include um, SEL program implementation, integration of SEL skill development within the curriculum and instruction, and through school practice, for example, positive school discipline policies and practices. Tier two may include small group instruction for students that need additional support with specific SEL skills and Tier 3 targets those high need students that require intensive and oftentimes individualized supports. So that's the three tiered system in regards to social emotional learning. So I'm going to ground us and take us back to why. Why do we do social emotional learning? Well, here's an example of the brain and how the brain works and more and more research is out there about what the brain does and how we learn. So the brain is a dynamic living structure made up of tissue that's most susceptible to change from experience, from our experiences and of any other tissue in the human body. Research suggests that our brains are malleable and adapts to good or bad environments and experiences. While the entire brain is implicated in the learning process, several key structures in the brain's limbic system, as you'll see here on the screen, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus work together seamlessly to facilitate effective learning, and in turn are shaped by our learning. The prefrontal cortex, located just behind our forehead in the brain's frontal lobe, helps to regulate thoughts, emotions, and behavior. For example, it's critical for carrying out a specific set of skills called executive functions, which includes working memory, cognitive flexibility, inhibitory control, complex problem solving, planning, and et cetera. The amygdala, those two small almond-shaped structures located on either side of the brain's temporal lobe, reacts to stress and emotional arousal. This means that the amygdala facilitates emotional reactions, including responding to stress, fear, danger by cueing the body, fight or flight, freeze response systems. The amygdala also plays an important role in modulating emotional memories. Now the hippocampus are the two symmetrical seahorse shaped structures located on either side of the brain's medial temporal lobe. Are one part of the brain responsible for housing, our learning and memory. These three interconnected regions of the brain's limbic system communicate with one another during the learning process. So that's new information. It's not only about academics, but the brain works in an orchestra to promote learning, including emotions, a sense of safety, and all the other non-academic good stuff. In addition, new research also shows that there is an important mechanism that helps us connect with other people's brains and they're called mirror neurons. Essentially, mirror neurons fire both when a person acts and when they observe someone else doing the same action, as though the observer himself were acting. For example, if we watch a disappointed child walking off the field after a loss of a game, we can feel that emotion as well. And then our brain makes a model of that emotion. This mechanism in our brain is the basis for emotional attunement and empathy. Thus, the investment in building strong and caring relationships translates to better learning and greater overall well being. So, what does this ultimately mean? Social and emotional learning skills, such as relatability and empathy, 
can be taught. So now what does it look like then in the classroom? How do we take research and implement it effectively? So considering the tremendous amount that's out there, building a strong SEL foundation as part of tier one practices and support for all students is critical for student success. Infusing SEL into the everyday experiences for students includes several approaches. One is explicit instruction, which ensures that students have consistent opportunities to cultivate, practice, and reflect on their social emotional competencies in ways that are developmentally appropriate and culturally responsive. SEL goals and competencies should be integrated as well into content and teaching strategies for academics. The class learning environment should also be supportive, culturally responsive, and focus on building relationships and communities. This gives you kind of the big picture for SEL implementation, and I'll share more about each of the component as we continue this discussion together. So now let's go back to those key structures of the brain that promote learning, specifically that prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. Considering when the neural architecture is impacted by the chronic and toxic stress and releasing, therefore, a hormone called cortisol. When the brain is experiencing too much stress, these structures have difficulty working together to effectively facilitate the learning process. Under conditions of toxic, chronic, and unbuff unbuffered stress, these structures become primed to be on high alert for danger and to react quickly, which in a normal setting is highly normal and keeps us alive and safe. But under conditions of toxic and chronic stress, the amygdala becomes hyperactive. This hyperactivity can mean that a child is in a constant state of high alert at all times, becoming extremely sensitive to potential triggers and connections within that and the prefrontal cortex, as well as connections between the prefrontal cortex and other regions start to deteriorate when there's too much constant stress. This impacts the student to be able to carry out typical cognitive control functions that may result in impulsivity, poor performance monitoring, reduced ability to regulate performance, impaired planning ability, reduced reasoning ability, difficulty generating strategies, being inflexible, and the inability to utilize feedback, which then also reduces working memory. So lots of challenges when a student is under constant stress. Research says, that at least two thirds of our children by the age of 16 have experienced some form of trauma. Also with the current pandemic conditions, such as the lack of social contact or isolation, negative stress increases, particularly in adolescence, when peer socialization is critical to well-being. SEL practices can mitigate the effects of this toxic stress. So how do we promote a resilient class culture, which is one component of social emotional learning um, implementation? Resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. Based on the work of the National Dropout Prevention Center Trauma Skilled Model, the five factors that significant, significantly contribute to resilience are, as you see on the screen, connection, belonging, achievement, autonomy, and fulfillment. So how do we build a strong culture of connection? 
the connection provides students with a feeling that they matter and someone cares about them. It's important to consider that children who have experienced trauma and toxic stress may oftentimes be distrustful, suspicious, and guarded. It will take patience on our part and a focus on them and their story, not ours, <laughs> and some authenticity to help them. We have to want to really know them. So what are some connection ideas? So here are some that are available to you. So demonstrating curiosity, for example, about a student's interests and passions. Without any judgment, finding that time to get to know them. Over the course of several interactions, become familiar with the student's interests, tendencies, and demeanor. And find their strengths. Show relevance and speak value in their characteristics and their skills. Be curious, ask them questions. You can plan questions ahead of time, but be prepared for some of those follow-up questions. And seek to find those common ground with them and you and seek to learn from them. So basically, it goes back to being authentic and truly caring about them as individuals. So how do we build to a culture of belonging? So, and what's the difference between belonging and connection? So belonging is a sense of acceptance, safety, and membership within the class and the school. Connection refers to individual relationships with another person, while belonging refers to the individual's relationship with the group. So it's the I and then the we. Belonging provides students with a sense that they belong and are accepted and fit in. Some vehicles that are useful for fostering belonging include what you see. So ensuring that their identity is incorporated in. So that sense of multiculturalism such as rituals, celebrations, symbols, models, clothing, that we're all diverse and unique and it's okay. Um, having high standards clearly and intentionally communicating and practicing standards of performance and belonging ensures and encourages aspiration and morale within the groups. Um, incorporating restorative practice, shaping discipline and resource allocation practices around diversity and inclusion instead of exclusion. And soliciting input from all segments of the, me of the membership. So um, student voice is critical there. And soliciting input um, in a purposeful, predictable, and intentional way, developing those routines that are identifiable and memorable and meaningful to the students. Another component is building that culture of achievement. So you see, we're talking about mindset shifts and it actually occurs both in the classroom, face-to-face -face setting, along with a distance setting as well. And being intentional about including this all in a distance setting as well too. So in a culture that fosters achievement, achievement is honored and celebrated. Students are viewed and interacted with from a perspective that they are valued by their strengths, not their deficiencies or inabilities. A culture that fosters achievement seeks to recognize, acknowledge, and leverage them for motivation to grow and foster and build capacity for achievement. Achievement provides students with a feeling of, I can. Students affected by stress and trauma may oftentimes believe that they are not capable of achievement. And some ways then to increase that sense of achievement could be identifying strengths through observations and self-assessments, and then offering affirmation to build confidence, allowing students to exercise areas of strength in academic and social de demonstrations, so making the space for them to utilize their strengths. 
uh, ask students to develop achievements in writing, to be able to articulate their achievements is much more powerful than checking off a list of competencies and assignments. And allowing students um, to help them measure their success of achievement. So where am I and where do I want to be and how am I progressing along the way? Also allowing members to use their strengths to help others make gains. So in a cooperative and collaborative learning environment, much of that can occur. And reinforcing achievement and I'm sorry, reinforcing acknowledgement and provide a tangible indicator of achievement. The other is building a culture of autonomy. A culture that fosters autonomy provides students the supports and preparation needed to make appropriate decisions. Students will have the option within boundaries <laughs> in activities, academics, discipline, and self-management, for example. Options are given within stated expectations and failure is viewed as a learning accomplishment. Autonomy provides students with a sense of, I have some control and I'm trusted to make some decisions. Some ideas that help foster autonomy is a diversity of activity, a wide variety of options, for example, or activities for engagement can provide motivation. Social emotional learning intelligence can provide tools for self-awareness and management and options and discipline that include restorative or growth options can provide that greatest return when the offender is involved and the development of those options and to demonstrate and the demonstration of learning can take different forms based upon the strengths and preferences of the student. And finally, the last component of a strong trauma skilled model is to build that culture of fulfillment. A culture that fosters fulfillment will provide its members opportunities for development and significance through contributions toward the needs and developments of others. Research shows that acts of service and generosity improve relationships. They also increase feelings of belonging and happiness. Fulfillment provides students with a sense of, I have something to offer. And so vehicles for fostering a culture of fulfillment include service learning. Utilizing services and projects in facilitation of academic learning. Allowing students to assist in tasks, planning and implementation of the service to the organization and other individuals. Service campaigns, so corp um, incorporating projects or community assistance and being purposeful. So building those habits of service through rituals, repetition and design. So that's kind of how we can shift toward a very positive, trauma-skilled, resilient culture where we're expecting or we, we act as if all students have had trauma and this will be good for everyone. So going back to research, what do we all want from ourselves and our loved ones? So think about that. What do we all want? Oftentimes it's good health, success in reaching our goals, happiness? Well, research shows that happiness, compassion, and kindness are actually products of skills that can be learned and enhanced through training. Thanks to that, and remember going back to the brain, Thanks to that neural plasticity or the malleability of the brains, Western neuroscience has now confirmed what Eastern wisdom has known for a long time, that happiness is a skill that we can learn. So we all wanna be happy. 
and we want our loved ones to be happy. And if these skills can be taught in order for us to be happy, then it is important for us to teach them. And one way to do so is explicit instruction of the social emotional learning competencies and skills, which are integral to learning and positive life experiences. So when selecting social emotional learning lessons, ensure that they are purposely sequenced, active, where students are actively participating in it, and focused and targeted by specific skill mastery so that there's some intentionality to ensuring that these skills are well taught. So here are some links to SEL programs or platforms that offer virtual resources such as Second Step. They have a rich base of remote learning resources that are, and many of them are actually free right now. Sanford Harmony actually offers an online learning portal that gives you the whole social emotional learning program free and many online resources as well. And Panorama Education offers a playbook of social emotional learning intervention strategies. So here's also a link to Panorama's SEL playbook. As part of the department, we have a contract with Panorama and all schools have access to their climate data, their student climate data, and if you go into the dashboard and if you don't have, if you don't initially have access to this link, you can get it from your administrator. And you'll see up in the top right hand corner, there's the playbook. And when you click on that playbook, you'll see a whole slew of SEL intervention activities and resources made available to you. Okay, so moving on now, did you know that completing eight weeks of mindfulness meditation classes can lead to structural changes of the brain? It can actually increase gray matter density in the hippocampus. Gray matter is a good thing, <laughs> known to be very important for learning and memory and in structures associated with self-awareness, compassion, and introspection. So if that is the case, then that is a very important thing to incorporate and integrate into our classrooms as well. So I just wanna share with you one resource. It's a well-being resource. And I had an opportunity to listen to Dr. Richard Davidson. So in 1992, he met the Dalai Lama and he said, his holiness challenged me. So he met the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama asked him, why are we not using tools of modern neuroscience to study qualities such as kindness and compassion rather than negative qualities of the mind, such as depression or anxiety? And he, I had no good answer, he said. So from that day on, he made, a, he made a commitment to his holiness and to himself that he would do everything within his power to help place these positive qualities on the scientific map. And since then, he's developed the Center for Healthy Minds, which in turn developed the kindness curriculum and later the Healthy Minds program app, which teaches awareness, connection, insight and purpose. And as part of that, there's a mindfulness component as well. So the link is there for you to try out and see how it works. It's good for you to try it out first and see how it goes and then share it with your students. Also find ways to incorporate even five minutes a day of mindful meditation or mindful practices when working with your students. It can have profound and powerful positive impacts on the brains, as you saw from research, and in both children and adults alike. Build in mindfulness 
to the ways you debrief and reflect on experiences as well and help your students develop positive, uh, positive and reduced negative internal chatter that we know we often have. The brain is a social organ that is not static, but instead continually adapts throughout life, our lifespan. The people around us and the experiences that we have with them shape our brain in powerful ways. So our brains are constantly evolving and our neural networks are remapping themselves through our interactions with each other. So the human brain has evolved to living in tribes. So we've become a very collaborative society. Tribal living involves small groups, cooperation, equity, cohesiveness, and shared responsibility. Positive relationships trigger our brain's chemistry to allow it to be more plastic and it enables us to learn more easily, whereas traumatic experiences negatively alter the brain and can shut down learning. In youth development, where a high priority is placed on building relationships, this investment can result in young people who are physiologically better able to learn. So if that is so, and if the relationship and social emotional skills are critical to well-being and learning, then it is important for us to intentionally provide the space for building strong and caring relationships. So a strategy to do so are check-ins between the teacher and the student, for example, um, and oftentimes students with students. So here you'll see one which is 10 minute teacher and student check-ins by appointment. So again, it goes back to being intentional. And it could be a time for you to just discuss those non-school related topics. Yes, there's times to do check-ins as well with academics, but find that time to just to get to know the students in that authentic way that I mentioned before. Another is organized student to student check ins, giving those students the space and the time to interact socially and practice those social emotional learning skills. And for example, provide community circles online and providing topics and uh, discussions or key ideas to discuss. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And I did want to share with you something that will be forthcoming in the future. So I mentioned Panorama and that playbook by which we have a contract for all of our schools to access. So Panorama does our school climate survey. They also offer an opt in. Uh, student social emotional learning surveys. So some of the schools have opted in to use that, which provides us with formative social emotional learning data on what our students are perceiving. And an upcoming offering that we're now exploring and maybe releasing soon, so be on the lookout for that, is social emotional learning check-ins. And that will also be made available on the dashboard as well. Okay, so another is um, providing then. So going back to that social interaction and the need for that and the practicing that's so important. Well, when providing the space and time for students to practice and apply these teaching skills or learning skills, we ensure that these skills are then solidified in the real world. So. What are some things we can do? We can promote those positive interactions through cooperative learning. But when we do cooperative learning, we wanna make sure that we have some parameters to ensure that it's a positive outcome for our students. So one is to incentivize that collaboration by having our sense of responsibility, such as jigsaw, learning where everybody has a part to share. The other is individual accountability, that everybody has a role as part of this. And I know we've done some of this before where you have a facilitator, a record keeper, and a recorder, and so on. 
The other is explicit training and group skills, being sure that you as educators scaffold, provide observation and reinforcing. And then the group processing and celebrations where individual groups reflect and receive positive reinforcement for their efforts when they're practicing cooperative learning. Because we know even as adults, that's even difficult for us sometimes. And so here I offer a resource, a cooperative learning resource, and the link is provided to you here. And I do know that this will be a this will be free and available at least um, for the time being as it's funded by the National Institute of Health, um, which guides and supports activities during small group peer learning lessons, either in person or online, making peer learning easy and fun and easy for the teacher to implement as well. Okay, so that was all the foundational things around social emotional learning that should be within a strong tier one system. Now I'm kind of, I'm going to move to tier two. So like academics, we face a range of student skill levels. While most students excel with general instruction and support, some students will need supplemental support. So in regard to social emotional learning, tier two support and interventions may involve circle-based support groups and restorative practices. Circle discussions foster community intimacy in a class. Inspired by restorative justice or RJ and its origins from criminal justice, RJ has become popular in schools as an alternative to traditional discipline approaches. It's a shift from focusing on consequences to focusing on responsibility and relationships. A peer circle process focuses on meaningful interactions that gather a group of students to discuss a specific topic. So how do you set up a circle? Schedule, first of all, schedule regular peer circle time sessions. Set up that purpose and expectations. For example, having those norms shared every time we start a circle, such as speaking from our heart, listen from our heart, and our privacy of everything that is said here stays here. Open the session with a mindful moment or icebreaker and identify a prompt or ask for topics of discussion from the group. And then always come with a close because circle time can be um, very intense and powerful. So it, it's always good to offer a closure either by one word reflections, for example, or even just a virtual high five. And, and then the reminder that everything said stays in the circle. So that's kind of the gist of tier two. So tier one, you're continuing to do tier two, providing that supplemental support along with those tier one practices. And then tier three, which then is for um, that one to maybe 5% of our students that need intensive and targeted support, individualized interventions that may be necessary. So all skills need instructional support, whether it's a specific social skill or other behavioral need, just like academics. So these four elements are part of social emotional learning within the multi-tiered system of support and they can be powerful influences on student learning. So all four are typical parts of a strong evidence-based social emotional learning curriculum as well. So going back to those individual students and ensuring that there is systematic explicit teaching and sometimes even the further breaking down of the skills and steps 
to further define them for the students within your lesson plans and then to be able to offer that instruction to the students. Oftentimes it may involve reteaching. It can be done in the moment and then in an intensive learning environment for these individual students as well. And then to be able to prompt reducing that need to correct students with short two to five minute prompts based on previously taught skills and um, prompting prior to the transition or the new activities, for example. And then offering feedback, making it short, include both verbal and nonverbal feedback and focus on what the student's doing well and correct only when needed. So I went through um, a lot of tier one, tier two, which is supplemental to tier one, and then that intensive support for individual students. And then sometimes these students in this tier three area might need additional support from school staff, such as counselors and school-based behavior health team as well. So I'm offering to you on this slide additional resources, resources for school counselor programs, mental health, and there's more there for social emotional learning and community resources too. And then what I have here are the resources that I use to put this all together. And each one is a link that will take you to the resource and even more resources within that. So that's kind of everything in a nutshell from HMTSS to the domain of social emotional learning within that multi tiered system of support. Uh, so I guess I can open it now and Gordon and I can be available for any questions that you might have. Gordon and Fern, thank you so much for an excellent, informative, just inspiring presentation with so much new knowledge and the value of the social emotional learning and integrating that into our virtual setting and so impressed and so much to learn and so much to navigate through your site. But would you be able to share your PowerPoint, please, with the resource link? Absolutely. Yes. No, thank you. Thank you so much for the feedback. And yes, we will share our links. Mickey or Charles, do you folks have a way to do that um, automatically or sh do we need to email people? Um, if you provide us with the link, we can go ahead and put it, um, add it to the, the module links when we put that up onto the website, it'll be all in one place the video recording or this webinar recording and the presentation. Great. Thank nice. You. Okay. So if there aren't any more questions, thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon and spending the rest of your day with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.